Hello everyone and welcome to the Happiness Index's Creating a Menopause Friendly Culture. Um, today we're here from the Happiness Index with some amazing superstar guests. But before we get into the conversation, I just wanted to remind everyone of the hierarchy of happiness and engagement. Happiness and engagement has many different drivers. Um, on the left, you can see the drivers of happiness. On the right, you can see the drivers of engagement. Principally, from a storytelling perspective, happiness is what our heart needs and engagement is what our brain needs. We're going to be talking about a lot of the subjects that you can see um, at the bottom part of this triangle. But I think predominantly a lot of the conversation will be around things like safety, work environment, trust and balance. But we probably will feature a lot of the conversations today. So we just wanted to give you the background because many people often think that something like menopause is a very different subject to engagement and happiness. But we know across the board of happiness and engagement, if people don't feel included in the environment, all of these factors can drop. Um, so that's just a bit of background. Um, the Happiness Index is a happiness and engagement platform. So if you want to know a organisation, go to thehappinessindex.com and book a demo. Um, but that's the, that's the context done. And I want to get out of this presentation because I'm now going to have a really interesting conversation with Lauren, Rachel and Teresa. So we're going to get rid of the slides. We're going to stop the share. And we're going to bring everyone back in gallery view so we can all have a have a, have a prop have a proper chat so i'm just going to go around the room and get everyone in the order that i can see them to introduce themselves rachel could you kick off and introduce yourself please yes yeah, certainly so great to be here my name is rachel achille and i'm group head of equity diversity and inclusion at manchester airport group thanks rachel and um we ask all our guests um we always want to know what makes you happy Oh, what makes me happy? Oh, lots of things. Smell of fresh bread. Um, I like going running for that of the endorphins. Uh, food. <laughs> um, <laughs> conversation with friends. <clears throat> lots of things. I like learning. So, yeah, you caught me on the hop there, but there are a few things that make me happy. We sneak that question in. We don't. We, we like to... I, I've never had fresh bread as the answer. That is a, that's a great answer. I love the that. Smell of fresh bread. Yeah, and I've heard it before, but not as an answer. And I ask this question every day. So I love it when there's a new answer in there. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Teresa. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, I, Teresa Winters, I work at Santander. Um, I head up the employee experience proposition. So that's our employer brand and, and also the experience our colleagues have every day. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, my uh, what makes me happy uh, friends family and most of all my dogs so hopefully people who've got dogs will know that they come ahead of everyone uh, so uh, my dogs yeah <laughs> I, ha I have this theory that that pets are better at communicating than human beings because they're just so good at sharing their emotions aren't they and I just think yeah. there's something we can learn from dogs and cats absolutely yeah thanks Teresa and last but not least um Lauren so I um, set up women of a certain stage after leaving my job thinking I had early onset dementia in my early 40s. Um, so what makes me happy is when I've done some form of delivery, training, coaching, whatever it happens to be, and I can see someone just have the penny drop and realise that it's not the end of the world. And I get that grin from somebody going, I've got this. That just lights me up. But the other thing that really lights me up is if I spend a day out in the mountains and I come back and I'm taking my walking boots off and I sit down with a nice hot cup of tea and that feeling of just having completely switched off for the whole day and connected with nature, nothing beats that. I love it. It's brilliant. And um, so I'm Matt. I am co-founder of the Happiness Index. And what makes me happy is probably a mix of all the stuff that you've all said and I think maybe we could we could probably have a good walk. We probably should have done this walk, walking. <laughs> we? Had some, we should have, should have gone for a dog walk in the mountains We've and had some. Set up a club already. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us today, um, and also thanks for the people that are listening in from from our community. Um, we we ask our community the type of subjects that they want to hear on, and, and, and menopause is something that has. There's been people really wanted to, to hear about and get to understand um, in the community. So I'm going to try and ask questions um, on behalf of the community. And Lauren, I'm going to direct the first question to you, which I think 
is our starting point really, which it, it sounds like an obvious question, but I think there'll be a lot of people that have come to this webinar also thinking this in their head, but what is the menopause and how many people at work are impacted? So everybody's impacted. You either go through it or you live, work or socialize with somebody going through it. So the answer is everybody. Menopause knowledge is for everybody. That's the most important thing. Menopause itself is literally when you stop producing an egg, you're no longer um, having your monthly cycles. You've gone 12 months without a monthly cycle and you are then classed as being menopausal. And for the rest of your life, you're postmenopausal. So we know that people that have um, periods will have them for roughly 37 years on average. And then they'll be halfway through their adult life when they become menopausal and they're going to live for another 37 years where they've got so many skills, knowledge and experience to offer back to their communities, their workplaces and everybody else. So I think the only thing to say really when we refer to menopause today, we're talking about the whole experience of going through perimenopause, which is a few years leading up to menopause where symptoms might start because your estrogen, progesterone and testosterone levels are beginning to decline and all the way through to when you balance back out again. For people who will experience menopause, typically symptoms will um, last for anywhere between 2 and 12, 2 and 15 years. It's a very unique experience. And the final point just to make about that is you have to think really broadly. So I would say to people, think about a blank canvas, menopause. Park all your thoughts and beliefs about it and let's build up our knowledge together. Mm -hmm. And remember that it's not just our women our non-binary gender questioning and our transgender community that can experience symptoms. I think I think Lauren that I just want to capture that point of starting again with a blank canvas. I think that's that's a really powerful point. Um, and before I mean I, I directed that at Lauren um, and we've got some more questions to bring Teresa and Rachel in but is there anything that, that either of you would Teresa or Rachel would like to add to that sort of the description of menopause? I, I think actually, I, I, one of the things that we we we've sort of done in our organisation, much like Lauren has said, we've always talked about it being a workplace topic, you know, for everyone, for the reasons that Lauren's explained. Because although you know um, some people go through it directly, others are impacted because they know someone who's going through it. So we always talk about it inclusively, and I think that's really powerful. I think the other thing that we really sort of try to talk about is that. It often, not always, but it often comes a time of life when there's lots of other things going on as well. And to Lauren's point, actually, you know, um, it's often at a time when your, you know, your career is going in a certain direction. You're, you know, you might be at your best in terms of what you want to achieve from your career, but also it can come at a time when you might have elderly parents. You might have children growing up and going through, going to university, doing their exams. So there's an awful lot going on in life generally. And I think that's that's something that, you know, when I started to understand more about menopause, uh, you know, quite late in life is it's kind of a penny drops. It's not just that, that you have to contend with. It's often with multiple other things as well, which, you know, is, is something to really be aware of, I think. And yeah. something I'd love to just add in there as well is that I thought that menopause was something old people went through. Yeah. It wasn't. You know, it, I didn't know. I went through it at 37 after I had my son, immediately after I had my son. So I really want to emphasize that people will become menopausal, not just naturally, but for surgical and medical reasons as well. At any age, Absolutely. the youngest ever recorded age of menopause was nine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. just just to, to, to put in a point on that, Lauren, and I checked that I could share this before, but someone in my team um, went through the menopause at the age of 31 um, mm -hmm. at, at Accident and. I would say, as someone who works, that, that that person shared that with me, and I was I asked if I could share that on on, on this webinar. But I, although that's a, a, a personal piece of information, that does help me knowing that piece of information as her colleague. It does help me um, mm -hmm. because there are times when it is relevant for us to have that conversation. So I, I think that is a really important point to bring it to bring it age age section, and it, it does link into the next question actually. Um, which Rachel, I'm going to go to you first on, which is what is the impact of menopause on individuals, businesses and the wider economy, which is a huge question. There's loads in there. But um, anything you want to pick out on that, please, Rachel? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the impact is huge. So, you know, on a personal level, you'll have all these kind of like physical and psychological effects um, of menopause, whether you know, with the hot flushes or, um, you know, the shivers and um, brain fog, all the kind of like physical and uh, psychological effects. A lot of people and um, 
we've actually had uh, Lauren Sheeran came over to um, talk to our uh, colleague resource group, which is set up our women's network and shared her story with us, which really resonated with a, a lot of the women in our women's network who said that, you know, they actually thought about stopping work because they were convinced that they had, you know, some kind of psychological illness or brain tumor or something or the other. So this, the, you know, it's not to be underestimated what the physical effects that that can have. But then, you know, as you can imagine, if someone is undergoing all this kind of stress and you know, it's true that stress makes you stupid um, because you've got all this adrenaline and cortisol that's going through your, your body, it means that you're not able to focus on the task at hand, which can obviously impact your productivity at work. And if you're not sharing that information with people, that affects your relationships. I think, you know, there's quite a huge kind of spiral of activity, you know, in a negative sense that can happen to you if you are going through the menopause and you're not reaching out for support or you don't know how to get support for yourself i think that that certainly where as a as a man where i benefited from the awareness because we had a, some internal training on menopause and i didn't know about brain fog and the interview that i was talking about earlier talked to me about it and now we have this we have this process where even yesterday, um, she messaged me after a meeting about something that if I didn't know, I might have assumed. So it literally sent me a voice note, like, what was that thing? What was that thing again we discussed? Even though the meeting was only 30 minutes ago, but because we've got the joint language, I can understand that. I just send a voice note back, no problem, we've moved on. But by, it, by having the internal training, the awareness, I would say as a colleague, it, it helped me um, work work with someone who went through menopause at a young age. Teresa, is there anything that you want to talk about, about awareness and, and for, for colleagues and so on internally that you could build on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, Rachel's touched on particularly the kind of the impact on it on individuals. And of course, that's why as an employer, you are ultimately wanting to support menopause, you know, because they, you know, your, your people are your, 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 your most important right, asset, you know. And, yeah. and, and so, but I think from an employer point of view, you know, it's, it's, as you start to become more aware as an employer about the reasons for supporting menopause, and there are many, not least, it's the right thing to do. It's the responsible mm. thing to do. Um, it's actually about understanding that, you know, it's this is not about sort of having, it's not always about having time off, you know, and illness and sickness and, and, that, pro and that productivity loss. It's actually about recognising that most of the all of the women that I speak to, you know, who are going through menopause, they want to stay in work, they want to be in work, you know, even with some quite significant symptoms. And and, and, and what our role is, because we care about their well-being and their health, is to try and help them to find different ways to sort of support them in their journey and to have the right access to the right sort of support. Um, and I think, but what we don't always consider as employers is that it's therefore that presenteeism factor that actually you've got people coming in that are really struggling with some symptoms, you know, mm. multiple symptoms, whether that's a bad night's sleep, whether, whatever that might be, then actually they're trying to do their best job. They're trying to do their best work and they're not always telling you, you know, most often they're silent. So, so the, 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 to your point, Matt, at the start of the call, the engagement factor, if you can support your colleagues and show you care going through menopause is, is, is significant, you know, and you can't actually always measure it. And that's why we kind of very much start from the point of view, it's the right thing to do. It's the responsible thing to do if you care about the health and well-being of your people. But actually, mm -hmm you know you do start to see those benefits we've seen that in our engagement you know and I think that um you know it's like mental health actually in that sense we're talking about menopause in the same way now that actually it's it affects so many people it's about having good conversations with people how they can manage their own mental health how you can manage your menopause journey so you know I think it's it's incredibly important as employers to recognize the impact it can have yeah, I think it's on so many levels. It, I mean, let's start with legislation. So it could be dignity at work. It could be, you know, well-being. You know, is it a protected characteristic under mental health? You know, it's, there are so many, that's just, you know, from, from that perspective, I think the culture of your organization is really important as to whether someone can speak about what they're going through and feel that they will be supported. So one of the things that we're working at at MAG is to kind of create that inclusive culture where, you know, a conversation such as the menopause conversation is not taboo. Um, so it's important that we have people come uh, and, and have a menopause champion as we do, who you can go and speak to, who can support you. We've developed a menopause policy again, which kind of is guidance for a line manager who might have someone in their team and it's all dependent on whether that person feels comfortable to have that conversation with their line manager and again that's part of the culture that we're trying to develop you know um 
say that they're having issues and then their line manager is able to provide support and has a sense of what you know reasonable adjustments they can put in place to support that individual so yeah I totally agree with you Teresa I think creating that inclusive culture you know it's a win-win for everybody you don't want someone who's got years of experience who's got you know that a positive psychological contract with the organization and wants to be there and do well you know to leave because they're not able to they don't feel like they're operating at their optimum and similarly you don't want them sitting there just being a bum on a seat you know mm -hmm. nobody wants to um come to work and not feel like they're making a meaningful contribution yeah. I think I'd love to make that that point there, Rachel. There, with Lauren's original point about menopause impacts everyone. Because mm -hmm. if you go back to the slide, like one of the drivers of happiness is safety, and yeah. we know happiness is a driver of business and financial performance. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not going to go through the menopause yourself, seeing how people are treated in your organisation is because we know if you go up on that triangle, safety is an instinctive feeling. Yeah. But even if you're not going to go for the menopause yourself and you see someone treated badly in your organisation, you may then think, well, well, then when I'm in a different situation, I'm, so mm -hmm. you know, it's really going to pick at that safety piece. So I just wanted to bring Lauren in that, in, on that point, because all that psychological safety, it, it's not just impacting this, this area, it's showing that you care about people generally, isn't it? Yeah, I think that, you know, this goes really broad and really deep into most organisations I've ever worked for or work with now and one of the key things I think we need to be really cognizant of as well is that the workplace as we know it is largely being designed for men by men and there's no hint of criticism in there whatsoever the workplace has changed and morphed and has evolved over the last 20 30 40 years but with the number of women going through menopause now in the UK alone we've got 13 and a half million menopausal women we know we've got somewhere between four and a half and a half million actually in the workplace that's an estimate and we we need to start thinking that anyone who has monthly cycle anyone who has menstrual cycles anyone who has fertility to to manage or miscarriages or pregnancy or menopause all of the demands the things that we're driven by you know go back to eastern progesterone and testosterone those three key hormones are driving our monthly cycle fertility or pregnancies or menopause and actually that means that we need a different setup we need to be having different conversations we need the people around us to feel comfortable to hear us you know I often say in talks you know when was the last time you were really well heard when did you walk away from a conversation and you went hey, how does that make you feel and and going back to you and your brain and your heart and what you need and that happiness factor so when you actually take time to listen to a colleague and you've got a culture where people can talk about menopause, whether, you know, I, I was thinking when you were talking about people going through it, people not going through it, I did a talk for a financial services firm a while back before the pandemic and this young couple walked out of the talk in tears. I was like, my goodness, what? Um, I was really worried. So we caught up afterwards and they came and they told me and it turned out they weren't a couple. They were... Um, 22 year old twins left home when they were 15. My mother hated them. It turned out during my talk, they joined the dots and realized that she'd just been going through menopause and they'd gone out to phone her while I finished off my talk and they reestablished the connection with her. So, it, you know, menopause goes far and deep. And, you know, whether it's your partner who's going through it and you're not getting a good night's sleep together, or, you know, there's a, a disconnect with a colleague who's always been really stable performer. It just has such broad reaching impact that are like, like um, Teresa was saying, your know, mental health and, and Rachel's mentioned too. We have to just normalize these conversations and that's a big cultural shift. Whether we go through the policy or the guidance route, whether we're doing general awareness, we need to have those things as the heartbeat of an organization so that we treat individuals as human beings. Because people, you know, as Teresa said, people are our biggest asset. And you know, even the word, using the word asset is, doesn't sit well with It me. doesn't, no, that's right. No, it doesn't sit well at all. But, you know, they're so important to our people with your business. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, sorry, go on, Teresa. No, sorry, I was just going to say, I mean I, I mean, I agree with that completely. I think, you know, it's, 
um, what, one of the things that we try to do with our managers, and I, went, I mentioned the mental health piece, because, because actually what we're trying to work with people managers on is that actually mm -hmm. the role of a people manager today in, 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 in business is to have really good conversations and to know their team. You know, and it's changed beyond belief and it's become even more that uh, after the pandemic, as a result of the pandemic. And I think that what we try to explain is we give them some information, we give them some facts to become aware. And then actually we say, you know, just like we don't expect you to be a career coach, or a career guidance counsellor, you know, and we don't expect you to be a psychologist for mental health. But with menopause, we don't expect you to be a menopause expert either. We just want you to have some facts and some information to be aware and then to be able to have a good conversation with your team members if they come to you for support. Um, and so I think we try to kind of lay that foundation because actually that's an important part of the psychological safety is that ability to be able to have a good conversation and, and to Lauren's point, feel heard. Mm. But I think the other thing is that what we've tried to do with our program of support is to provide a range of ways that people can get access to the right support they need because we could have the best culture in the world we could have the best people managers but not everyone going through menopause will want to speak to somebody about it you know and so you need to have those different routes to provide that support i think as an employer so whether that's your website as we have we have a menopause site where you've got links to really reputable sources of support on going through that way you know we partner with peppy who provide practitioner nurse practitioner support at the end of your phone um, but whether, or whether it's just reaching out to a colleague and we have advocates in our business who you can reach out to to get support it's finding different ways that build that psychological safety yeah, yeah. and one example of that is you know we have menopause as an absence reason um, and we didn't have that until about a year ago. Um, and actually, whilst not everyone will tick that box bravely to sort of say, I was off with menopause and I want to have a conversation, the fact that it's there on a piece of paper alongside all of the other reasons people would have is another way of building safety in the organisation because it's, mm. you're talking about it, you're openly saying we recognise that people will be off through menopause. So I think there's lots of ways that you can kind of build that psychological sense of, sense of psychological safety. We, it's, in, it's interesting what you said there, Teresa, in the, in, the, in the story that Lauren was sharing, because I think it was April time we did our, one of our um, menopause webinars, one of the team did it. And I specifically remember someone saying that it had improved their marriage. And what I found fascinating is because we know that happiness, if you're happier at work, you're happier at home. If you're happier at home, you're happier at work. It's like, like this this cycle. And that, that, that just stood, that just stuck in my head. And I, and I would say, it's improved my relationship with my sisters because I have greater awareness of, of stuff that I just didn't, but that I'd learned I, that I'd learned at work. And before before we go on, there's one point that Rachel mentioned. I need to come back to Rachel that I think for our listeners, you mentioned and correct me if I'm wrong. You mentioned a, a menopause champion. Is that right? Yes. Can you, can you just talk us through? What, what that is, how you came to have that role, how it works. I think the, the people listening would, would love to know a little bit about that, Rachel. Yeah, sure. So I can't take any credit for that. Um, that was something that was established by a member of staff who was going through menopause and essentially had, you know, ladies of a certain stage, as uh, Lauren would call them, um, in, in her working group. And um, they approached us as, as the women's network and said that they wanted to create a subgroup. So um, they came as a subgroup to one of the committee meetings of our women's network and, and talked about some of the issues that they were facing and so on and so forth. And they asked us if we would, you know, provide a platform for them to get together, which we did. You know, we asked them what they needed. And, you know, in the same way that we, um, we, we often we always go out and say you know what do you need we don't want things to be prescriptive we have to be human about it and think you know and give people exactly what it is that they want and some of the stuff that they they said they needed were you know uh, was this menopause policy uh, it was one of the reasons that we invited Lauren in to come and talk um, to us within the business to help to kind of um, to create a better understanding of what menopause is, how it affects people and how we could support. Um, we were also able to um, get some of our, our first line managers to come on that course um, because it gave them an opportunity to really understand, you know, how they could support and how they could spot the signs. And so if you do have people, you know, as has been said earlier, who don't necessarily want to reveal, but you uh, you get the impression that they might be struggling, you can automatically start to put some of the um, checks and mechanisms in place that will support them um, in the workplace. So just things that being able to take breaks, sitting them 
in areas you know near a window or maybe not near a window allowing them to have you know extra change of clothing you know it's very difficult because we work in an airport environment we do have people who are uh, frontline as well as those who are uh, back office so it's very much about tailoring that and then our champions are um they they support us to kind of signpost people so they're at the first port of call sometimes that people can go to um we have an intranet site which has lots of information and they will go onto there contact their champion speak to someone and the champion can contact us if they prefer things to work that way they can go to our eap or oc health and then we put together whatever program that that uh, individual requires it's not prescriptive it's just you know a catch-all i guess a, a support mechanism for anyone who may be struggling or who may want some support within the organization it just means that everyone's got a vehicle a channel that they can kind of use to um back to you know group head office and that's kind of what you have to do when you work for a large organization Rachel when do you when you take something on let's take something on champing in anything that can also create a pressure for the individual as well is there is there anything that you do to support the champions as well because that's that's there's a lot of pre I imagine there's a lot of pressure to that role as well. Absolutely. So we have a structure and that's a really good question because, you know, supervision is something that we've talked about. Um, but currently what we do have is that we have our chairs of our colleague resource groups and um, they sort of I, I support, I lead those and support those. And what happens is, you know, if our champion or somebody is struggling, then they will um, let me or the chair of their network know. And uh, so that's kind of our check and balance. And, you know, as I mentioned before, we also have our employee assistance program, which is quite, you know, a broad um, service that offers counselling and support if necessary. Um, uh, and we just try and tackle things in that way. Thanks, Teresa. And I think you have something similar under a, di a different name. Is that is that right? Yeah, very similar. So we have what we call menopause advocates. It's the same principle. Um, and we've kind of built them up over a couple of years through talking about menopause more. So they're people who volunteered to be advocates because they're passionate about supporting menopause, either because they have their own menopause journey or we actually I'm really proud of that. Out of the 25 we have, we have three men which has been a real win, you know, and they've stepped forward because either their partner's going through menopause or actually they're a manager supporting a colleague. Um, and, and, and we've trained them to run awareness sessions in our business so they can run short awareness sessions for colleagues or, uh, or short awareness sessions for managers as well. Uh, and so we use that. And to answer your question, I think for us, I mean, it, it's a job that they're not they're not paid extra for. They're just passionate about it. Um, so what we try to do is meet with them monthly, talk about what we're working on. They're doing some amazing work and talking to people. But we're always clear that their role is to is to signpost people to support. It's never to advise none of that. So they shouldn't be under that pressure. Yeah. It's just to signpost people to the support we have and to run awareness sessions. So we got training for them so that they they understand, you know, the facts and they've got a deck that they go through. But but they're all passionate in different ways. And um, but it's a side of job activity. So I'm always very conscious of that, you know. Teresa, have you found like when we did the, the first menopause session, it then sparked other conversations around things like periods and, and, and subjects like that that had been not not discussed outwardly that much at the happiness index before but once it was like we started with menopause and it opened up so many important conversations have, have you seen that at santander definitely um and, and i mean i think we were already starting to talk about um, fertility shortly after we started our menopause work a few years ago um, and we you know we provide sort of support and, and webinars and guidance and, and, and access to support for that with, with, our, with our colleagues but I think other areas have started to surface as well where we're actually now starting to think more broadly from a women's health perspective you know yeah. and I think menopause has led the way because I you know and I think you know that's a good thing because I was asked the other day on a panel about shouldn't we be talking more broadly about women's health and not menopause but actually menopause is the one that's helping to drive that and i think we should yeah. absolutely have to continue the conversation around menopause but we're now starting to think about okay women's health more broadly and actually we, we are looking at the moment around what we're doing around support for periods you know how we can manage that at, at the whole range of women's health so i think that's where the conversation is going to go to in time and with the women's health minister now you know i think a lot of these things are going to be great so i think it's just it's finding the right way and the right time to bring these things in and to, to bring them together yeah and I think uh, Lauren I'd love to bring you in here because I think tennis have started a conversation now haven't they about like you said like a lot of work is, is designed by men for men and in tennis they've started to to bring in like kit that isn't white for women that, that are going through periods and things like that 
but we're quite an, obviously an open group. We're doing a webinar. Probably the people who are listening to this are almost like the people that are open to having a conversation about menopause. The people that are not have probably not signed up for this webinar, right? So, but it still seems to be, is there still a taboo around this subject? And if there is, can we help the people that are listening to go and speak to other people to make it less of a, a, a taboo, Lauren? I suppose there's a couple of questions in that. Yeah, I think, you know, sport has has been progressing a lot. Women's sport has been progressing a lot. You know, because football teams were in the press recently. They've changed the colour of their kit. Um, tennis, sprinting, gymnastics, athletics, the, you know, the, there is progress. There's an awful lot of work still to be done. We know that somewhere between, and depending which bit of research you read and which company you talk to, um, you're going to hear that somewhere between 16 and 24% of companies have now got menopause on the agenda in one way, shape or form. So there's a whole heap of work still to do. I think that, you know, when we, we think about the workplace, I just want to put a bit of context around the fact that the majority of people that are approaching and going through menopause now were not trained about this. Um, they weren't taught about it at school. Their parents weren't talking to them about it. Because in the UK, our doctors aren't routinely trained in menopause or women's health yet, although the 24-25 student intake will be, there is nowhere else that people are going to learn about menopause. Mm -hmm. So if we don't do this education in the work, I think that you know we're, we're on a hiding to nothing. So that culture shift and change is absolutely fundamental. Um, so um, I've completely forgotten your question now, Matt. How about that menopausal moment? It was, it was really about, I, I'm predicting that most people who are listening to this webinar yeah. are probably, yeah. pro, probably get this subject, but we want them to go away and help sort of break yeah. down to do in their organisation. So just advice on that. Yeah, so I think, you know, if I'm delivering a general awareness session, if I'm doing a line management training session or a champion training session, then the key thing, it doesn't matter what type of session someone has come along to. And um, the core thing that I always say to people, first of all, is to get really confident in your own, you know, in your own energy, saying the word menopause out loud. So we always wrap up a session by saying menopause out loud three times each just to get yeah. that confidence and consolidate. But the next thing is a bit very much like we've been saying already, when someone's done that training, we need to make that the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. We have to have it in comms. We have to have our champions understand if they signpost, what are they actually signposting someone to? Yeah. It's all very well to have an EAP, you know, employee assistance program or private medical. So we want to invite people who have done the training to go away and investigate what's really there, to try out those services and find out what is on hand so they can make the right signposting. Finally, the key thing I always say to someone is, what's your golden nugget? What was your aha moment, your takeaway, breakthrough thought when you listen to this session? Who are you going to disseminate that with? Are you going to go and share with your team that you've been on this webinar, that you've listened to this? Yeah. And share with them and, and message out that you have put your toe in the water, build up your yeah. knowledge, or you've come along to consolidate your knowledge and you just want to share with them what your takeaways from the session are today. Because that yes. cascade of information is where we're going to get the real power to move things forward. So I'm going to speak to the listeners now. If you have a breakthrough moment and there's something that you've learned here, message us, put it on social, share it with your team or whatever. Just let us know because we we, we would love to hear that. Thank, thank you for that, Lauren. Um, Rachel, I just want to pick up on a point you said. You, in terms of the airport, you've got quite, in terms of roles, diversity of role within your organisation must be quite broad from there's so many jobs in an airport isn't that um so we want to listen like as lauren and Teresa were saying earlier like you want to be f to to feel heard but what advice have we got on listening up because some of us are terrible at listening like can we give people that are listening some advice on how on how to listen on these subjects rachel and i'm, I'm specifically gone to you because I imagine your workforce is so different. It's probably the most challenging of, of, of all of us on here. It really is. And that's one of the reasons why we've tried to put some guidance together, particularly on this topic um, for line managers. Um, but we, because, you know, as we've alluded to, and, and not just guidance, there's also some like online learning um, that someone can undertake in order to be able to have that conversation. We also have, uh, and, and 
there's the stuff around menopause. It's like a, it's a 101 package that we have. So we've got like a menopause 101. We have some guidance for line managers. And then what we have is actually um, a template for a care plan. And that allows the individual to have a conversation with their line manager and say, okay, these are the things. So it's not prescriptive as such, it's open. Um, but active listening, I guess that's an issue for all of us really, isn't it? It's one of those things that we always can, you know, continuously have to work on. Um, how best to answer your question? I, I'm not entirely sure that we have um, the right formula, but certainly we are trying to encourage those conversations to happen. We have um, a survey that we do, you know, employee engagement survey that we do um, twice a year. And, you know, we have certain questions in there that we use as our temperature check as to whether or not people are getting the things that they need, whether they're getting the support that they want. And each team is tasked then with kind of like, you know, we benchmark these scores, obviously, and then we try and dig deeper and understand, you know, where we may be falling down as an organisation and how we can support the, um, support the individuals or the teams um, so that we can do better. So I'm not saying that we always get it right, but in terms of trying to create those checks and balances, certainly that's one of the things that is what that we have in place. Teresa, anything anything from your industry? That you'd Just like? a couple of things, I suppose. I mean, I think where 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 Rachel and I are similar as organisations is we're both big organisations, um, and I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that, that I find in, you know, we've been on our journey for three years and actually the hardest thing for me is to know that there's still our employees, some of our employees who don't know we provide any menopause support, you know, even though we talk about it regularly and we kind of have advocates in place because it's such a challenge when you've got multiple sites and people out, you know, that, and there's so much going on in business to try and really get that, get that out. So I, but I think the way that we would, that Rachel's already talked about it, that we have mechanisms is we have people networks. So I have, we have seven people networks, mental health, women in business, you know, LGBTQ plus, you know, um, uh, disability network. We have lots of different networks. So we always communicate through those and they mm. have an opportunity to share back. So in a big organization, that's a way of being heard and listening, if you like. Um, and then we also have a, a continuous survey that goes out. Um, so we like, you know, like Rachel, we listen to that feedback. And then once a year, and we're doing that for World Menopause Day next week, we're, you know, we're, we're, this month, we're, we're going to be actually sending a survey out to our employees going through menopause. And we do that every year to hear what their experience is, um, what they know about the support we provide, what suggestions they have for us around what we could do and what support they want from their managers. Um, yeah. And we kind of always do that every year because that helps to inform our thinking for the following year. I think um, I just want to add a direct quote to that, Teresa. Um, I, again, we got a quote from one of our team that I just want to read out around when you get when you get in that further down. It, it, it just says, I found it hard to admit what is happening to me, but feel better now I have. And the, the context behind that is they felt like they couldn't have these conversations at work and that in their head it was a big thing to happen. But now it's been normalized. It's just like. It's all just moved on and, we, and it's opened up these other conversations. So I just wanted to bring an example of that. I can't believe we've only got five minutes. I've got so much stuff that's coming into my head that I want that, that I want to ask. So the final question, how can you introduce and structure support around menopause to build an inclusive culture? Lauren, I'm, I'm going to go to you to kick us off on that one. Um, so because I know that Teresa and Rachel are working with large organisations and have got a really great comprehensive plan in place, I'll talk to those that are maybe in a slightly different situation. So for employers who are not yet convinced of the value in investing in this training or who haven't quite you know, gotten to that point in their inclusivity and their diversity journey, because we're all at different stages, I think that's important to recognize. So what I invite people to do is two things. Start to help make this the heartbeat of the organization use the women of a certain stage free three-day course it runs every two months it's live and we've taken over 15,000 people through it in 2022 already Brilliant. so the free three-day course is half an hour a day every second month and then so that it doesn't get lost every other month run a menopause social create an event online or in person you could go for a walk you could have a book club it doesn't matter what it is create a safe space where people know they can come and share their questions their experiences of menopause so you've just got every month you've got a free course or you've got a social and people know that that is just continually being communicated out so new starters can just get caught up 
people that have been there longer can share and can signpost and can guide, and then people can move things forward from there. Brilliant. And we've, I know people have got meetings to get to, so we've got about 65 seconds. So <laughs> I'm going to ask everyone just to, to sum up in one point. Um, if someone's listening and they've been inspired by today, like what's the one, what's the one bit of advice in a couple of sentences um, that, that, that you would give them to take away from today? Wow. Uh, uh, well, my, my view would be start talking about it. I mean, it depends on where you are, but honestly, yeah, start yes. the conversation. You'll be amazed when you start the conversation, uh, either directly with someone that they'll have a view, they'll have a response, they might have a partner at home. You'd be, you'd be very surprised, actually, how many people are interested once you start to talk about menopause. Uh, so my advice would be start talking about it if you haven't already. And then my second point would be data. Get your data in your organisation. It's so powerful if you can find out how many women you've got, potentially in the age range we know it's wide but the main age range how many people have been off get some data around it because actually that can really help you in your organization to think about what's the case for doing this i love that so we've got we've got start talking collect data rachel lauren anything my answer is going to be to the individual who is you know either pre or experiencing some of the symptoms of menopause and that's you know obviously to reach out to be open um and to trust that they will get the support if they will get the right channels and also um just something that there's a, a lady who i follow on linkedin put out recently when she turned 60 and she says that every time she's thought this is it you know this is the end you know the end stage or the pinnacle of her life something else happens so mm -hmm. let's not look at it as drawing the line on where you are at the you know it in life look at it as kind of a blossoming new stage in life mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the biggest takeaway that I can really offer somebody I love that I love that Rachel Lauren anything you want to close us out on talk and ask for help as soon as you need it would be my top two and so I think we're all completely aligned but my other top tip is drink lots of water drink. <laughs> I love that <laughs> so I, I'm just going to sum that up, those, those final points, which is talk, data, it's a new stage, um, ask for help and drink lots of water. I think that's the perfect place to finish. <laughs> I have one thing to do, which is, Teresa, Rachel and Lauren, thank you so much for sharing this information, because if our audience have learned as much as me, then they'll, they'll go away having learned a lot. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.